Hi, I'm Donald McIntyre, founder of Etherplan. And in this video, I am going to talk about the history and future of Ethereum Classic. The history starts with cypherpunks in the 1980s. The cypherpunks um, used the recently invented private key cryptography to create a vision of a world where they could have uh, a private uh, way of interacting between people uh, through secure channels over the internet. The vision was that the internet was going to bring a lot of freedom and liberties to people, but at the same time the internet was going to be a source of surveillance and control of people. So they wanted to make sure that using cryptography uh, and cryptology they, they could build products and services that could enable people to um, interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis through private channels and anonymous ways so they wouldn't be surveilled by governments and corporations and controlled uh, very much like uh, we are seeing today and in, in in modern times in 2021 where there's a lot of surveillance increasing and corporations like amazon google etc they record our information and they give it to the government so it's like a partnership uh, so, so all these tools, and they started to be built in the in the 80s and 90s and components as well. Um, the other, in, in, in this world where they would create uh, a private world in the internet where they could do commerce and communicate freely without censorship and controls, um, one thing that they realized that they had to create was uh, a way of um, of payments no, and creating money over these uh, uh, secure channels. The other thing is that to, to be able to, to interact uh, uh, there, were, there were going to be also uh, programs what are called smart contracts that would, would be necessary. For, exa for example an escrow account uh, that is a, a program instead of a bank or, or a centralized entity would serve to monitor uh, transactions between two free people, two peers, and if the transaction went through, then the, the escrow smart contract would, would pay uh, to the seller uh, once, the, uh, once the, the, the buyer received the product, for example. That, that, so smart contracts was part of the equation of this vision that they had, and um, the, the whole purpose uh, and the philosophy was to minimize trust uh, on third parties, of third parties. For example, when someone sends money today uh, from one party to another using a bank, that bank is a trusted third party and it's widely known how banks uh, have failed in the past and, uh, and uh, can be controlled by governments uh, and they can censor transactions or control or even prevent people from even opening accounts. Uh, so all this, all these technologies uh, had a, 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 the almost, a, a, an overarching goal of minimizing the trust or the dependencies on, on third parties. As well, these third parties can easily be controlled by governments. So, so it's all it's all connected to this vision that the internet could be both things: either a beacon of freedom or a beacon of absolute control and tyranny. You Not know, through 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 top-down governments, etc. So the first technology that led to, to what we know today as the blockchain industry or crypto or Bitcoin was Hashcash. Hashcash was invented by Adam Back in 1997. Hashcash, the, the idea was basically to aid um, email, email servers uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis to prevent spam. So, so basically what the, the system did is if a, if a server or a computer was sending an email to another server or, computer, com, uh, or computer, the sending server or computer had to do a proof of work first. For example, one minute of many cycles in the local computer solving a, an arbitrary crypto, cryptographic puzzle. And once that uh, proof that uh, work uh, was done, it generates a hash, which is a 64-digit uh, string of, of numbers, hexadecimal 
It's a it's a hexa 64 digit hexadecimal number, and that number is a proof uh, that the local computer did did the um, the work, and it would be attached to the email sent, and the receiver would receive this email with the proof, and very easily could verify that the sender uh, did the work, um, and this would prevent e uh, email spam because um, if, the, if senders had to do this work per email, uh, imagine that they wanted to sell a, send the spam of a million emails to, to many people, uh, each email would have to work one minute, so it would be one million minutes of computer cycles to be able to execute the spam. So that was the idea. Um, that, an important thing is that the receiving, the receiving computers uh, can very easily uh, verify that the, that the stamp, the cryptographic stamp, or, or that 64-digit uh, hexadecimal number, uh, is the proof uh, of work. That's that's one of the keys of proof of work. That is that the that the stamp or the cryptographic um, proof is extremely difficult to create because you need to work a lot solving the puzzle locally, uh, but it's extremely and it's trivial, like in milliseconds, you can you can verify that the proof is correct, uh, and that this is one of the keys uh, for for what we know today of the of the Bitcoin. So then, uh, this was 1997. Early in early 1998, uh, Nick Szabo, <clears throat> uh, when he saw uh, the invention of proof of work or hash cash, he immediately realized that it could that it was analogous to gold but in the internet or in the digital world. Uh, the analogy that he did is that if you, if you think about it, you get an ounce of gold in your hand, and that's really a proof that miners somewhere in the world uh, worked to, to produce that gold. So gold, for example, is worth $1,800, and um, the... the it is it, it, the, the, the work that miners have to do uh, to produce one ounce of gold approximates or, or tends to be close to $1,800. Say that in, in reality, um, uh, gold miners today pr uh, spend uh, $1,200 or $1,500 to produce an ounce of gold, and then the rest of them is their margin. But uh, the point is that when you, when you have an ounce of gold, um, it is, in a, in a way, a proof of work, uh, and this is why gold is scarce and why it's valuable, no? why we humans value gold. Um, so, and then he said, the, in the same way, we could, we could say that a proof of work, a hash cash or a proof of work from a computer is, um, is analogous to an ounce of gold, because to, to, if, we, if, I, if I get and verify uh, a proof of work, a computer-based a computer proof of work, uh, I know that a computer had to work a lot and burn electricity and computer cycles to, to produce that hash. So a, a hash in the digital world, uh, a proof of work hash in a digital world is analogous to gold. So he, he invented uh, BitGold and described it in the, in the cypherpunk email lists where they used to communicate. Uh, and that's how BitGold, he invented BitGold uh, as an analogy to gold in the real world. Uh, but it's, it's basically a scarce object or scarce objects in the digital world, which is another key for what we know today as Bitcoin and the blockchain industry. Immediate, very In the same email list uh, that Nick Sabo published his idea of BitGold and the description of how it would work, um, Wei Dai uh, later, uh, yeah, debating with Nick Sabo, um, posted an article where he described something called B money. So it was later in 1998. B money basically he's, is is using um, is basically to to have a network of computers where the computers or some of the computers uh, work a lot to create proofs of work. Um, the analogies that they mine, it's not real mining like in the real world, but it is called mining. So they would mine, and once they solve arbitrary puzzles, they would publish these proofs of work, uh, which are the, the cryptographic stamps, 
and the rest of the computers, when they, once they receive the proof of work um, and they verify that, that the work was done, they would credit to the account of the computer who did the work uh, an arbitrary amount of money. No, uh, at the time it, it was just an arbitrary amount of money, and and the way that I imagined that it could be dollars, for example. Um, but um, it it could also be totally uh, just a um, uh, an artificial token that was created to represent that proof of work. Uh, so that's that's more or less the structure of Bitcoin today, and 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 you have hash cash, which is proof of work, Bitgold, which is the concept that to use hashcash as a, as a source of scarcity in the digital world, uh, which is, was a problem that it was nearly impossible to solve or very difficult to solve. And then uh, to apply those two ideas in a network was the idea of Wei Dai. Um, then, then in 2004, um, Hal Feeney uh, created another uh, idea uh, also um, using bit gold like it be money uh, but it was called rpow or reusable proofs of work basically it was a different model he said okay let's have a computer a network of computers with a central server that is the verifier uh, so any computer in the in the network can can create a proof of work say work x amount of minutes and and generates a hundred dollars uh, of work or, or yeah, most, uh, make a hundred dollars of work and produce a cryptographic stamp uh, and then that person can email the cryptographic stamp to anybody and whoever receives that email with a cryptographic stamp uses the central server to verify uh, that the stamp is, is true, no? that there was real work created from the sender. Uh, that idea didn't work uh, because it, it required a central server, so the system would trust that the whoever was the admin of those central servers. Uh, B money also didn't work because there was a double spending problem uh, where where there was no way of controlling in the network of computers in, in, in B money if people were spending several times the same proof of work. The same in, in the case of Bitcoin, it, it had the same problem. Of the double spend problem, uh, but also because because a, a, a bit gold stamp or cryptographic stamp is not fungible with any other stamp, um, it needed a market, a decentralized market, so people could buy and sell the the bit gold um, to, to 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 price each each of the non fungible um, cryptographic stamps, and then they they could create um, like bundles of, of bit gold and then generate a coin so it was very difficult at the time and there was no solution to to these problems uh, so th these are the the important thing about the history of 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 the cypherpunks and the and the people who created bitcoin ethereum and ethereum classic is that their main goal was high security and to minimize trust in third parties um, and that and that they 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 were looking to generate a sound and hard money, not not money that anyone can can create easily, but money that is only created after uh, entities or miners or or, or computers um, had to work a lot to create that money because that's a, a fundamental uh, feature of sound money. Then uh, then in in, in 2008, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper. It was debated within the, the cypherpunk circles. Uh, and in 2009, he published the first uh, software and um, the Bitcoin network was born. You know? Hal Finney, for example, was, was one of the nodes and, and Satoshi Nakamoto and there's, there's publicly, you can Google a lot of information of their conversations and emails. Um, so it was published and, and what, what was the innovation? Basically, um, Bit, Bitcoin is only, um, it's a network of computers uh, around the world. It, it, there's tens of thousands of computers around the world that are miners and nodes uh, in this network. It's a totally decentralized network and they all host uh, 
the, the only thing that it does is that they all host a ledger with accounts and balances. So it's very simple. It's a very simple setup. Uh, and, and the other, um, the other uh, feature is that whenever any computer wants to send a transaction, for example, to move Bitcoin from one account to the other, that transaction has to be fully transmitted to all the network. Um, if uh, transactions and blocks and the, 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 all the information of the ledger is, is transmitted to all the nodes, then you can create something that is full replication of the database. The database is this ledger with accounts and balances. So full transmission enables full replication. That this is a full replication is a fundamental security uh, feature or assumption of Bitcoin. This is that the ledger with all the accounts and all the balances has to be repeated and copied in every single computer in the network. This is a key security feature. Um, the other feature of Bitcoin that he created is the the addition of, of new transactions into the ledger in the form of blocks. So what happens is that when uh, when all when anyone in the network wants to send a transaction to move Bitcoin from account A to account B, they send that, that transaction to all the nodes and the nodes go accumulating all these transactions uh, and they form blocks. Uh, the miners, the, the, the nodes who are miners, which are not all the nodes, some of them, a subset of the nodes are miners. The other nodes are, sim are simply, um, they simply store the, the blockchain or the ledger and, and they receive new blocks from, from the miners and they verify them. Uh, but the miners get these groups of transactions every 10 minutes and, and, and then they do the proof of work using the data of the transactions and they create the cryptographic hash of that block. So today, basically all the base of miners around the world of Bitcoin, they work for 10 minutes burning a lot of electricity to just to create this cryptographic hash, which is like a cryptographic stamp. Uh, they add it to the block of transactions uh, of those in, in that period of time of 10 minutes. And when they find and when they finish the proof of work, uh, they immediately send the block uh, and fully transmitted to the rest of the network to be verified. Uh, this means that all the nodes are going to receive that block and they're all going to, once they verify it, if it's correct, and then they're going to put it in, in, the lo in their local database where they have the blockchain or the ledger with accounts and balances and that's going to update the, the blockchain to the latest, um, to the latest state. Um, uh, it's important that to know that all the miners are working every 10 minutes and they're spending around $300,000 in gear, data centers, salaries of their employees and electricity. Around 60% is the electricity cost uh, just to create this cryptographic hash uh, with the block, with the block of transactions. No? Uh, and they are all competing. So of all the miners, one is going to win. Um, and, and they are competing. So who, if, if whoever finds the block first, they send it as soon as possible to win because sometimes very, uh, more or less at the same time or very close in time, another miner could have uh, produced a block and they send it as well and the two blocks compete. So this is just to illustrate that the miners uh, act independently, uh, but in the aggregate, they spend $300,000 approximately. Um, of, of electricity. This is the, the block reward times the current price, around $45,000. Um, so, so the miners in this, uh, they are very analogous to miners in the, in the real world, miners of gold, no? Because miners of gold, they're all collectively trying to get gold. Uh, and whoever gets the gold is the one who can sell it and, and they earn the money. Uh, and whoever doesn't get gold, they just burnt capital. Uh, and, and they lost that capital. Um, the, in, so following the example of, of B money, Bitcoin, what, what it does is whenever, when all the nodes in the network receive a new block and they verify it, once it's confirmed, they, they accredit currently 6.25 Bitcoins per block 
to the miner that sent the block. And that's how uh, Bitcoins are issued. Uh, the blocks originally, in the first four years, they paid 50 uh, coins per Bitcoins per, per block. And, and the, monetary, the fixed monetary policy of Bitcoin um, reduces the block reward every four years to one half of the previous one. So uh, the first four years were 50, then it was 25, then it was 12.5. Now in the current uh, epoch or era, it, it's paying 6.25. It started in 2020. And in 2024, it's going to be reduced to 3.125 then in, in 2028 to 1.5625 and so on to the future this this um the this quantity and and, uh, and method and, and monetary policy uh, if if you get since the genesis of bitcoin uh, to the future uh, with this the, with this diminishing uh, payment per block um, the, the result is that there are only going to be 21 million Bitcoins in the history of Bitcoin. And this is going to be more or less in the year 2130. Um, so this is the monetary policy. It's algorithmic. It's not, it's not, nobody can print money or do anything with it. It's just fixed and it's never going to change. Uh, and um, and this, is, this is satisfies the characteristic of scarcity and thus sound money. So in summary, what proof of work does? No, no, this is not in summary. What proof of work does uh, is, is is several things, uh, and and this is one of the great uh, genius, uh, brilliant inventions of of Satoshi Nakamoto. The first feature is that the cost of creating blocks is roughly equal to the cost of creating the currency. Just like mining gold, uh, the same happens with uh, the hashes, the block hashes in Bitcoin. Uh, so this this is with the scarcity, digital scarcity, and 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 how sound money is solved on the internet. The second thing, which is the brilliant invention, is that it enables the consensus between all computers. The problem of the double spending problem, or the problem of having computer networks do this in a decentralized way, we know with no centralized authority, was that there was no way of telling all the computers which is the correct block, which are the latest transactions, and that all agree at the same time. Uh, this was solved because the hash itself, the proof of work per block, is sufficient information uh, for all the nodes when they receive the blocks and they verify it to know that the great majority of miners worked on that block. Therefore, it must be the honest block. Example, I am a node, I am one of 60,000 nodes in the network. I, I, all the other nodes are strangers, I don't know them and we don't communicate in any, any other way. I just receive a block and I, and I see that the transactions are, are correct, so I verify them and I see that the hash, the cryptographic hash, is also correct because it's trivial to check. So I know that a miner worked a lot for 10 minutes to, to create this block. Once I have that information, if I receive any other block, that doesn't have those characteristics and and that there was no work of all the miners for 10 minutes spending three hundred thousand dollars in 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 uh, gear and electricity i know that that other block is false is, is is a dishonest block so this is how bitcoin created consensus um and and all the nodes know when they receive blocks that are correct and they know for sure that it's the last block in the network if for some reason there's a conflict where two or three miners created blocks at the same time and, and a node receives uh, two or three blocks at the same time, they just put them pending <clears throat> and when they receive the next one and, and the next one is going to be built on top of one of the three, then they know that that is the correct chain and they're going to discard the other two. So the, this consensus mechanism was the great invention of Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, the other, the other, um, the other feature that proof of work provides is that it's a safe focal point of, of entry, exit, and re-entry to the network. This is a key feature to make um, Bitcoin private, decentralized, and permissionless. Any node can be turned off or on whenever they want. Any miner can start mining or stop mining whenever they want. So, uh, if if there's sixty thousand nodes or eighty thousand nodes around the world, and my node is is working on Bitcoin, um, 
I can turn it off for, for several days or when, however time I want. And when I come back, I just reconnect to other nodes. They start sending me the history of the blockchain. And when I, and when I reach the, the end of the blockchain, um, adding the new blocks, I'm going to know I am in the, um, in, the, in the correct blockchain. If for some reason some of, the, some of those nodes are attackers and they're sending me a fake, a fake um, blockchain, it's very easy because once I get the two, the fake one and the real one, just by measuring the proof of work done on the, on, on the real one, I'm going to know that the fake one is, is false and dishonest because it, it is practically impossible uh, to with a current base of mining that there is to have um, uh, a, a, a parallel blockchain uh, that will win so so by having this rule that I always have to follow the blockchain that has the most work done on it is the way for all nodes to to to, to participate to enter and as new nodes in the network exit and re-entry whenever they want. This is a key feature. For example, whenever a country shuts down Bitcoin, like in China, uh, they can move to another country, restart the nodes and everything. And, and, and with this method of focal point using proof of work is that they, everybody starts working on the, on the correct chain on a global scale, even if they don't know each other. Uh, the, the other feature is that it proof of work because you need a lot of work to falsify the chain uh, or to falsify a single a single block in the current state then it's very difficult to at, for attackers to actually attack bitcoin and send um, false blocks why because they would need the same amount at least the same amount of hash power as all the miners in the world uh, so it is possible to send a false block uh, and for the rest of the nodes to, to eat it and accept it. Uh, but um, two things. One, it has to be, it has to have the correct transactions formed the correct way and it has to have the, the proof of work done. So you need a lot of computing power and this is why the, the, the current blocks when, 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 when building the blockchain with new blocks, it is protected by, by the miners uh, just by their sheer po computing power. And the same computer power computing power is cumulative. That means that since Genesis, all the 700,000 blocks that have been creating up to now, 700 and something, uh, if someone wants to modify a block of the past, for example, a block that happened a year ago, they have to redo with a proof of work all the blocks ever since, since, since that trans transaction, modify the transaction, and then send a full blockchain to the rest of the network to accept it. And to do that, to, to modify the past, is in practice impossible because you would need uh, a, a lot of time, months working on that with a huge computing base, identical or larger than Bitcoin, just to be able to, to, to modify a, um, a transaction of the past. So this is what protects transactions and, and this is why transactions, as they get older, uh, they become even more secure. So in summary, Nakamoto consensus is full transmission of the data to all the nodes particip participating. Full rep this enables full replication. This means that the, the blockchain and the ledger with accounts and balances are replicated in all the nodes globally. Proof of work is the key for securing the network and for creating sound money and for letting people uh, enter and leave the chain whenever they want. Um, it has a system of block production to enable these features. And the incentive for people to participate is the payment, uh, no? that they earn money. And this is why Bitcoin is so valuable and so many miners want to participate to secure the network because they want the payment per block. Uh, what does it accomplish? It accomplished something that they, it has never, had never been invented before and the cypherpunks were we're seeking for a long time, which is trust minimization, because Bitcoin, there's no central planner, there's no central authority, nobody controls Bitcoin. You just uh, use the software and participate in the network and it's impossible to, to shut down. Uh, and that uh, trust minimization is, is analogous to decentralization, which is analogous to security. 
um, because it, it because it's distributed globally, just like the internet, where all the nodes are everywhere. And as long as there are nodes of the internet, uh, it, it is working. The same happens with uh, Bitcoin. As long as long as there is a node somewhere, Bitcoin continues to live. So. If for some reason there is a region of the world where there is a nuclear war and everything disappears in that and all the nodes and miners in that section of the world disappear, it doesn't matter because the rest of, of the network is still alive with miners and nodes, etc. So it's, it survives a nuclear war. This, this was a concept that was the original concept of the Internet in the 60s because it was a military invention. Um, um, then um, for communications and then and then it solves uh, the, the problem of hard money like I said before so this is Bitcoin the the thing that the Bitcoin did not um, solve was the um, smart contracts so Bitcoin like I said before it's just a ledger with accounts and balances and everybody can send transactions from one account to the other that's it it's simple however in in 2013 Vitalik Buterin who is who is not a who he's not a cypherpunk, but um, he was into Bitcoin since since very early. Uh, he 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 invented a method to to create pro pro programmability. So basically, he created a network called Ethereum, uh, which is the same as Bitcoin but adds programmability. Uh, however, it doesn't have a fixed monetary policy uh, like uh, Bitcoin. Um, uh, um, um, but um, it has the ledger that stores accounts and balances, but also stores software programs. Um, the components of Ethereum are a virtual machine. Uh, it's called the Ethereum Virtual Machine or EVM. Basically, it's a piece of software added to the nodes, to the node software, uh, that acts like a, like a virtual computer. So this virtual computer is replicated in all the nodes globally of Ethereum and they all have the same virtual computer uh, and they all know, all those virtual computers know how to compute programs inside Ethereum. Uh, so, so it's like a computer but it's software based and it's replicated around the world in all the nodes. The, the other thing is that he, he created a programming language or uh, called Solidity and th this virtual computer uh, with all the opcodes etc uh, it can read this uh, this language or the product of this language the programmability of this language and can execute whatever the programs say the other thing uh, that it has is something called state which is a computer science uh, concept for computing uh, bitcoin doesn't have a state what bitcoin has is basically is a chain of transactions so if an account has uh, account A has one Bitcoin and somebody wants to send it to account B they send the transaction and the Bitcoin uh, network is going to store uh, to instructions that says uh, account the one Bitcoin from account A is moved to account B and if you want to send it to account C another transaction has to be sent uh, that says move one Bitcoin to account, from account B to account C um, and then the network to know what is the balance of account C, they go and check the string of transactions. So they have to check to know that account C has one Bitcoin. They have to check that there is a transaction from B to C and then from A to B. Uh, so it's basically the way of knowing uh, the balance of an account in Bitcoin is a string of transactions. It's not a state system. In the case of Ethereum, it's basically uh, different way of operating where if you want to send money from A to B to C basically it's, it sends a transaction that says debit account A1 and credit account B1 and then you can forget about account A it doesn't matter because it's stored the state is stored where account B has one a bit, uh, Ethereum one Ether uh, and then you, if you want to move it to C you send the same kind of transactions and the network is going to debit from B and credit C and they can throw away the previous transaction. So the way to check the balance uh, or the state of an account in Ethereum is basically go and check account X and it says X balance and that's it. Uh, so it's a different model but that model in computer science is key to be able to create programmability. Something that if you want to Google, um, you can Google state machine and uh, and um, 
uh, Alan Turing and how he invented computing, etc. Bueno, the the next uh, feature or component is the gas system, which is the way of paying uh, all the nodes in the network to perform this com the computing uh, of programs, and uh, and it pays them fees. Basically, the gas system, each opcode in a program has a, an, a, a, a determine uh, an amount of gas that it has to be paid by users uh, for that program to be to be executed or that opcode to be executed. So so the gas system send, when when you send in the, a transaction, you send it with the next amount of gas with a payment for that gas according to the ma market price. And all the computers in the network are going to receive that transaction and are going to work up to that amount of gas. And they if they couldn't finish computing the transaction, they just return the transaction with uh, with an error and, and return the money. This is this solves something that you can also Google. It's called the halting problem in, co in computer science. Um, because computers sometimes um, they just um, get, they, they, they start computing programs and they can't finish uh, because of some software glitch or, or whatever happened at the at the time. And uh, being Ethereum a decentralized uh, system, it had to solve that problem especially in a decentralized network with thousands of computers globally. Uh, and the last component is that it actually stores the program. So if I am a developer and I want to build a, an application like Uniswap or, or any other application, a lending application, insurance application, any DeFi or any, any kind of application on, on a network like Ethereum, I basically program the uh, in Solidity, the software program, and I send it to the network. Once I send it to the network, because it has to be sent to all the nodes, it's going to be replicated in all the nodes globally and it becomes a decentralized program. So this is the key of programmability in Ethereum and how Vitalik uh, solved uh, that problem. And so basically it's the same as, as Bitcoin, but it added programmability. This programmability enables applications, which are called apps in the normal world, but in the in the blockchain world, they become uh, decentralized, and therefore they're called decentralized applications, which is DApps. So basically, DApps is the same as an app in a phone, but it's a DApp because it's it's on a blockchain instead of, you know, of a centralized server. The one key thing that to to know about um, Ethereum is that it's moving to proof of stake. So it's basically uh, eliminating proof of work, which is one of the key inventions of Bitcoin and of the cypherpunks and is moving to a new system that I'm going to explain now. What is the difference between, between proof of work and proof of stake? Proof of work, like, like I said before, uses a lot of electricity and work, computing work, to generate these cryptographic proofs or cryptographic stamps. Um, proof of stake replaced that with deposits of money in the native currency. What does that mean? So Ethereum, when they move to proof of stake, instead of having miners around the world working a lot to create each block, um, they are going to replace them with capitalists. That means that people with a lot of money, they open a special account in Ethereum. Um, and instead of performing a lot of work, they just earn, just because they made this deposit, just like a bank, they earn the right to produce blocks for for the network. So basically it, they eliminate the, um, the component of, um, of scarcity in a way because it becomes a, a completely subjective kind of system, but it has uh, benefits, no? it, it is a trade-off. The, the benefit is that uh, proof of work, even though it's more secure, it's much less scalable because, the, because of these features that it demands first the work and second it demands full replication in all the nodes in the world. Um, for that, the blocks have to be limited in size in terms of megabytes, uh, because if not, it becomes very difficult to, to distribute all that information around the world. Uh, because of that, the blocks have, have a limit in size and they can only produce uh, a limited amount of transactions per, per day. For example, Bitcoin with its current model of, of blocks every 10 minutes, they can, they, it can produce only 576,000 transactions per day. And Ethereum, because they have shorter 
block times of 15 seconds instead of 15 minutes, it can produce a million and a half transactions per day. Uh, the problem is that to compete with normal cloud services or banking system or payment systems like Visa, etc., they process billions of transactions uh, per day. So the difference is enormous. And this is why the Ethereum is migrating to something called Ethereum 2, where they throw away proof of work and they use proof of stake because proof of stake is is less secure because it doesn't use and it doesn't have it, it's a it's a hundred percent subjective system um, uh, because it doesn't use the the power of proof of work but much more scalable they can totally compete with all the systems in the world um, so that's the trade trade off that trade off is very important to to understand and it's very important to understand that a proof of work blockchain is less less scalable but it's uh, indestructible and it's impossible to reverse uh, and a proof of stake network is subjective it's not objective like proof of work um, it can be uh, it is more risky uh, but it's much more scalable so it it, it 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 approximates the banking system in that sense because it uses capitalists the banking system does the same and in fact i think that in the future the banks are going to be the staking nodes and the block producers in proof of proof of stake systems. So this is this is where Ethereum Classic history starts. Uh, after Ethereum was created, you can see here that Ethereum was created, and for a long time it was a unified blockchain. But in 2016, someone created something called the DAO, which was like a mutual fund. Everybody sent money. They sent 150 million dollars. Uh, and the DAO was going to do investments, etc., based on a voting mechanism, and everybody, all the shareholders were going to participate and earn whatever returns the investment created, etc. The thing is that there was a hacker uh, who stole $50 million from that program. It was the program had a glitch, and, and, and it, it stole uh, the hacker stole $50 million at the time. And um, the majority of the community, after much debate, they decided to reverse the funds. What, what does that mean? They decided to say, okay, let's just move the money manually from, from the account of the hacker and give it back to the original investors of the DAO. That, of course, is identical as, as the banking system. That's how it works. And, it, and uh, basically, it's a huge violation of cypherpunk principles. And a huge and uh, a huge violation of the whole concept of a blockchain. Um, so it was a, ma a manual intervention. Uh, they all decided, and all the nodes, 95% of the nodes in the network decided to to do this irregular state change. And on block 1,920,000, which was in 2016, they <clears throat> they entered a block. Uh, that deleted arbitrarily the money from the hacker and gave it back to to the to the original investors of the DAO. So 95% of the community went with that fork of Ethereum, which is this one here, the one below. This is Ethereum. When you see Ethereum, which is very valuable uh, everywhere, it is not the original Ethereum. It is this Ethereum that has that fork and and uh, reversal of the chain manual reversal of the chain in block 1,920,000 ethereum classic is the original chain and the hacked money is there and and it's and it's much smaller because uh, five percent stayed with five percent of the community stayed with ethereum classic um, and the difference is is that like i said before ethereum will move to proof of stake and has no monetary fixed monetary policy and ethereum classic will stay forever with proof of work it's, it's doing the trade-off of staying with a security of proof of work uh, and less scalable uh, so it's going to be for special high value uh, uh, decentralized applications rather than retail applications and it changed the monetary policy after the split to a fixed monetary policy identical to bitcoin so Bitcoin is going to, the same way Bitcoin is going to have 21 million coins in, in the history of Bitcoin. Ethereum Classic is going to have 210 million coins. So this is this is the what created this division. 
And it's very important to understand in this light that Ethereum Classic is the original chain, never changed, and it's highly secure because of its features, that it's proof of work and it has a fixed monetary policy. <clears throat> Ethereum Classic, when it, when when this split occurred, it was very traumatic, and uh, the community of Ethereum Classic at the time uh, wrote what is called the Ethereum Classic Declaration Declaration of Independence. That Declaration of Independence explains why they stayed with the original chain, and explains the principles of Ethereum Classic. One one of the paragraphs says, "Code is law. There shall be no changes to the to the Ethereum Classic code." that violate the properties of immutability, fungibility, or sanctity of the ledger. Transactions or ledger history cannot for any reason be reversed or modified. Hence, the origin of the motto of, of uh, Ethereum, Classic, Ethereum Classic, which is code is law. So this is, this is the, 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 these are the principles of Ethereum Classic. In, you can Google Ethereum Classic Declaration of Independence. It's a two-page document. And you're going to see uh, all the principles of Ethereum Classic and what is the reason of existing of Ethereum Classic. What are the use cases of Ethereum Classic? Bueno, real reduction of dependence on trusted third parties, uh, just like Bitcoin and just like the original cypherpunk principles. Reduction of interference by governments, uh, for example, capital controls, know your customer, anti-money laundering restrictions, etc. That is, that is leaving so many people out and increasing cost so much uh, and making the banking system so arbitrary. Uh, so Ethereum Classic has increased security in general in time and space. This means that in 50 years or 100 years, Ethereum Classic is going to be working the same way. If you have an account, it's still going to be there. Your balance is going to be there. And the only person that can modify your account or interact with your smart contracts and, and decentralized uh, apps can only do it with the private keys. Uh, there's no way that any government corporation can modify that. And this is the concept of code is law. Um, in space means that it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in the North Pole, in the Southern Pole, in China, in India, in Afghanistan, in North Korea, Cuba, North America, Europe. Argentina or Brazil or in the bottom of the sea or in space that you are going to uh, that Ethereum Classic is going to work the same way everywhere and it's going to be fully replicated everywhere and you can go in and start working if you want to be a node or a miner and you can leave and enter again this is the basic concept of high security it's, a, it's an extreme concept very difficult to understand by 95% of the people. This is why 95% of the people went with the, with the fourth Ethereum instead of staying with the immutable code is law Ethereum classic. Um, then if with these features and all these benefits, um, Ethereum classic, just like Bitcoin, is an excellent saving investment vehicle uh, and also for reserves of corporations, central banks, governments, etc. It's going to be extremely valuable digital gold, just like Bitcoin. It can be used to transfer money, payments, remittances. It's happening. For example, I send money to my kids in Argentina that has capital controls in ETC. Um, it is used for, it, it may be used for settlements. Uh, um, for example, large payments between banks or between corporations or between uh, whoever needs to do a large payment can be done in a highly secure way in Ethereum Classic or a government who wants to pay a bond, a debt, or, or a government project uh, can use Ethereum Classic, which is going to be a highly secure way and programmable to do those things. When it has contracts, which adds the programmability and agreements between uh, people, businesses, governments, and entities in general. It can be used for securities, for example, bonds, stocks, and deriv derivatives can be um, yeah, most issued and stored in, in a highly secure blockchain like Ethereum Classic and decentralized applications in general. Today, Ethereum Classic has many NFT projects. It has, uh, there, there's an NFT exchange being built uh, and there's a huge opportunity uh, to create uh, uh, liquidity pools and a swap system as well. Um, and all these kinds of applications I'm going to explain later uh, in more detail. 
Uh, a key, a key uh, thing to understand Ethereum Classic and its future value and, and mission and role and positioning is that the industry, the blockchain industry is going to be layered. What does that mean? In the beginning, years ago, we all thought that everything was going to happen inside Bitcoin and that's it. Bueno, very soon we realized that because of its lack of scalability, that was not going to be possible. The same thing with uh, Ethereum. Um, so what's going to happen is that the the uh, the blockchain for several reasons is going to be layered where you're going to have the most secure and unscalable uh, components like bitcoin and ethereum classic is are going to be at the base layer and then uh, the proof of stake blockchains and other layers are going to work on top and provide more scalability and things like that and both combined the layers combined are going to provide the combination of high scalability and high security. Um, why this is going to happen first? Um, because um, first there's going to be few uh, blockchains in the future. It's not going to be like today that there's 14,000 blockchains. Of all those blockchains, because of something called the format war that you can Google or standard war, um, only a few are going to be the big winners. This is, for example, a stand, typical standard word in history is the one between Tesla, Nikola Tesla, and uh, Thomas Edison. That Thomas Edison was in favor of DC or direct current in electricity. Uh, and Nikola Tesla invented and he was in favor of uh, alternated current, AC. Uh, after a few years of, of a war between the two systems, um, AC1 and today the general generally accepted and standard for electricity in the world for household use and and many other things is AC um, so th that's the, what's happening today when you see many blockchains uh, at the base layer for example Bitcoin, Ethereum Classic, Doge, Litecoin, BCH, BSV, Bitcoin Gold, I don't know Mon Mon Monero, Zcash and like that there's there's hundreds and when you see all the proof of stake smart contracts blockchain, which are going to be layer two, like um, Cardano, Polkadot, Avalanche, Solana, <coughs> Tezos, etc., and so many more, um, it's, it's not that all of them are going to be successful. Only at most um, three or four are going to prevail in each layer. So in the future, it's very likely that Bitcoin and Ethereum Classic, because it's programmable, and maybe two more like Litecoin and maybe Doge are going to prevail at the base layer where Bitcoin is going to be the largest one, Ethereum Classic the second one, and Doge the third and Litecoin the fourth, for example, and all the rest are going to be small and trivial. And in the second layer, you're, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have a big one. Very likely it's going to be Ethereum 2. Uh, and then you're going to have a second one trailing. Uh, it, it may be Solana or 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 bnb or or sol uh, or cardano or polka dot we don't know yet and then you're going to have another one or two and then the rest are going to be trivial the the, the layering concept um it happens everywhere the internet is a layered system uh, you can you can google the the internet layered uh, system and and there's many diagrams that, that show when when you, when you use the internet it's not that it's a message from your computer to Google and it comes back and, and, it, and it's just a direct interrelationship. No, there's like seven or eight layers of the internet that are used at the same time, from the physical layer to the network layer uh, to the communications layer. There's many layers and components that together form a, pro a final product, which is the internet. And the same thing is going to happen in the blockchain industry. I'm going to show now how. Systemic risks, uh, that's another thing that is going to create concentration, not only because the format war um, uh, digamos, leads the market to choose a very few systems uh, to use as standards, but also because there's a philosophy in Bitcoin, for example, that says that the only blockchain that is ever going to exist is Bitcoin and the rest are all going to die. Well, that's not going to happen uh, because although things tend to concentration because of the standard war. But there's also a counter force, which is that people are not going to risk everything in one single standard or one single system. So it's impossible that Bitcoin is going to be the only blockchain at the base layer and Ethereum, Ethereum is going to be the only blockchain in the second layer. 
nobody is going to delegate in one blockchain uh, the whole, all the systems of the world. And this is why uh, more than one blockchain is going to exist per layer. And I think it's going to be three or four blockchains because this is how in general uh, technical systems have been uh, have behaved now today for example in operating systems we have the four big operating systems are windows um, mac os then ios for iphones and android for for non-iphone telephones um, and so we have four and they all have a different role and they have a different reason for their existence and and this is why uh, in each layer of the blockchain industry there's going to be three or four blockchains that are they're all going to have a different positioning and a different role in the in the system and the system as a whole is going to be the final product not a single blockchain just like the internet and then um, so layers and components will be divided by security versus performance this is very important so we already know that proof of work is more secure less scalable proof of stake is more scalable but less secure when and that is going to determine the layers and the components so the the final settlements and finality layer for immutability is going to be the base and the core of the global blockchain industry and and that's where you're going to have bitcoin ethereum classic uh, and the others and this is where ethereum classic is going to live ethereum classic is not going to be um a retail um for gaming videos and all that 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 that's going to be in higher layers the core is going to be for high security and large settlements uh, and then ethereum 2 and the rest are going to be and all the rest of the products and components are going to be on top so this is all that i have just explained is is here in one diagram as you can see here at the base i put bitcoin and ethereum classic as the biggest two in the future they are layer one and they're more scalable and more secure, less scalable. But because of the scarcity of transaction volume, each transaction is going to have higher fees. As you can see today, Ethereum, Ethereum that has not migrated yet because it has a limited amount of space in the blocks, the transactions fees have reached $100 or $200. And this that is uh, a proof that the transactions are going to be very expensive at the base layer in Bitcoin and Ethereum Classic in the future. And it's also proof that as the rewards per block are, go are going to diminish, they're going to be replaced by transaction fees. So mining is going to stay very large in these base layer blockchains. And proof of work is going to continue to secure them because the payments to them are going to be very large precisely because the transaction fees are going to be high. This means that transaction high transaction fees is good for the world and is good for the blockchain. It's not bad, um, which is a narrative that is wrong uh, in the in the market. Transaction fees have to be low in the other layers. So here I put here the second layer are proof of stake systems, sharding. So they're not going to have full replication. That mean, this means that the database and blockchain are going to be divided, so they can process more transactions, and they're going to have channels, rollups, etc. All these things are going to be layer two solutions for scalability. This layer is going to process and compete with Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, the banking system, Visa, etc., and all the cloud systems. On top, there's more layers. So on top of these, of these systems, we're, we're going to have the decentralized applications like decentralized exchanges, NFTs, table coins, loans, games, videos, or everything is going to run on top of layer two. But the, the applications themselves are not part of the blockchain so they're they're called layer three i call them layer three because they are systems that are on top of uh the proof of stake um blockchains um, and the last layer the layer four is basically what we use to interact so M metamask trust wallet uh my ether wallet um, um or 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 my crypto etc all those wallets uh, are basically the layer four. So when when you use a wallet to in, to send a transaction to Ethereum, it's, it's you are in the layer four, and the transaction is sent to the layer two. Uh, and when when you have a wallet and you're interacting with Uniswap, you have you are in layer four, and the trans transaction is sent to Uniswap in the layer three. 
which, which uh, is going to use the layer 2 to execute the transaction, the computing power of the layer 2. And in the future, is, uh, this layer 2 is going to connect to Bitcoin and Ethereum Classic for settlements. You can go to etherplan.com to learn much more about these. This is a real world example of how these components and layers are going to work. For example, we have in layer one. Um, oh, sorry, before I wanted to say that the layer two or the layers above layer one are going to be less secure, but much more scalable and they're going to have very low fees. So that's why everything's going to work just fine. Um, here is the same uh, diagram as before, but where I put examples of real life System. So we have Bitcoin and the Lightning Network is a scalability solution on top of Bitcoin. Lightning Network is a proof of stake system <clears throat> that they move the coins here and whenever someone wants to uh, withdraw the coins, they send the transaction to Bitcoin. So uh, Bitcoin receive few transactions, but large and when they are very important for final settlement. But billions of transactions can be, can be done here in the meantime. And, and here Liquid and, and Rootstock or RSK are programmability solutions on top of Bitcoin and they connect to Bitcoin. So this is a typical example of what I'm saying of the layered approach and components. Uh, Ethereum 2 is going to be here in layer 2 and it's going to connect to Bitcoin, it's going to connect to Ethereum Classic, to Dogecoin, Litecoin, Monero, etc. in the base layer. And the same thing with BNB, Sol, ADA, Polkadot, etc. And then we have, for example, Uniswap is an application that is on top of Ethereum 2.0 today um, and in the future Uniswap is going to use the best components for each function and Uniswap is going to be a more of a of a, a of, um, of an external application outside of Ethereum but it's going to be, use Ethereum, Bitcoin and Ethereum Classic and others to finalize all the transactions and trades that occur there. And the same thing is going to happen to all of these other kinds of applications. So you have lending, you have collateralized stable coins. A stable coin is not a blockchain. A stable coin is a coin inside a blockchain that is attached to or pegged to a fiat currency like the dollar or the euro. Uh, so Tether or USDT is inside Ethereum um, but it is an application, a layer three application inside Ethereum. It's not, it's not a blockchain in itself. And then you have NFTs and collectibles. These are very important. I'm going to do a separate video about these things, about exchanges and NFTs. And um, uh, yes, th these are the collateral for the stable coins. And then you have the stable coins here. Here's USDT, etc. These are all apps. They're not the base systems or the operating systems. And then you have all here the examples of all the the, the, the wallets. No? So when you interact with Binance and Coinbase and you move money from one place to the other or send it to decentralized applications, etc., basically you are in the layer four. And the layer four also had these different levels of security. This, these are centralized. These are also centralized. Um, and then you have my Ether Wallet or my Crypto, which are apps that you can download in your phone or your, your computer. So you control more your private keys and these are, these are more decentralized. And you have MetaMask, Exodus and Trust Wallet, for example, that are extensions. Or in the case of Exodus, you can download it in your, in your computer and you have your own private keys with these two. Uh, you hold them and you have the 12 words, etc. Uh, so you you have full security in the sense that you control the private keys and nobody else has them. Nobody can confiscate or steal your money as long as you take care of the private keys. And then you have Ledger and Trezor and other hardware wallets which are even more secure because the private keys don't even touch your phone or your computer. They are, they are in a pen drive and um, you just connect them to your computer when you want to sign a transaction but but then they are disconnected and the private keys are never in your computer so nobody can steal them a hacker cannot steal them with you from you <clears throat> so if, if ethereum classic has all these benefits and um, features what is what is the future in terms of what teams can what can the teams do to develop in the future for ethereum classic so my ideas are these 10 ideas 
one, to tell individuals and families to invest in ETC as a store of value. So that's a very important application. I have all my, worth, my wealth in Ethereum Classic and for long-term financial planning. Um, then promote ETC to proof-of-stake blockchains for anchoring and monetary services. So layer two proof-of-stake blockchains, because they're less secure, if they connect to Ethereum Classic, they, they can become much more secure. This is called anchoring. And they can use the monetary services of ETC because they ha it has a fixed monetary policy. So they can peg their coins to ETC and do all sorts of things to, to make their, their money much more secure. Um, tell uh, layer three and layer four systems to use ETC as a settlements layer. For, for example, Uniswap could use ETC directly as a settlements layer. Convince governments to use ETC for treasury reserves and large payments. So this is just because it's sound money. Uh, governments should use it for their reserves as they're going to be using Bitcoin if they are not doing it already. And for large, large transfers, no? Convince central banks to use ETC for their reserves, that is the same concept, and high, high value real time settlements. Promote ETC to supranational organizations like the IMF to use it for their reserves and multilateral smart contracts. So if the IMF has a loan with complex rules to, to, to a nation, um, and and that nation has to go paying according to the, to the to these rules. When a, this ca could be a smart contract in Ethereum Classic, <clears throat> and the world could could audit that smart contract and the payments and everything, so it would be much more secure and transparent. Convince the banks to use ETC for settlements, securities issuance, derivatives, and large value transfers. Tell multinational corporations to use ETC for large value smart contracts with providers and clients. This is the famous value chain kind of use case for blockchains where all the providers and clients and the corporation are connected and they can all see in real time the transactions and how products are moved from one place to the other and the payments can flow based on those activities. Show teams and small businesses that ETC is good to manage their capital. Um, shareholder registries and to use how val high value dApps and services. So uh, any company or a team can say, okay, let's get together, let's do a product, let's sell our product and we are shareholders and that shareholder uh, agreement and the shares can be on ETC instead of having traditional corporations in centralized registries that can be confiscated and manipulated by governments, etc. Uh, and finally, build basic infrastructure like DeFi, uh, for example, NFTs, NFT markets, and swap markets. This is very important. Ethereum Classic is a huge opportunity. NFTs already exist, ETC punks, uh, but those are collectibles. So NFT technology in itself, uh, in itself is very important because in the future, a car is going to be an NFT and it's going to be transferable property is going to be transferable in, in inside Ethereum Classic. A building in New York is going to be an NF, represented as an NFT and whenever it's sold it can be transferred uh, or that NFT can be owned by many uh, owners. Um, many things can be done with unique objects, unique non-fungible non objects on the ETC blockchain. And for this an NFT market or NFT markets are very important where people can can sell their cars or their buildings or apartments or yachts or airplanes or any kind of objects, external objects inside the blockchain. And once they're transferred, the new person with their private keys assumes control of those objects or property. <clears throat> also, the property can be digital like collectibles that, that's being used today, or it could be contracts and future cash flows. Many things can be used, can be represented through NFTs and traded in markets. And then swap markets for ERC tokens or tokens in general are very important. And there's a huge opportunity for a team to create a swap system like Uniswap, but in ETC, but that is going to be used for large transactions. So all this story uh, and features of ETC would be consistent with this technical roadmap. So ETC in the future should move to SHA-3 which is a more efficient mining algorithm. Um, it, uh, the proposal is going is, is there, it's already built in the node clients, and it's just a matter of the community deciding to activate it. Fly client is a technology for interconnectivity with other blockchains. Uh, 
which is important. If, if, if the blockchain is going to be a web of, of blockchains connecting and components all interacting between themselves, then ETC needs to have all these interoperab interoperability technologies like fly client. Account versioning, this is uh, to enforce something that is very important. Uh, ETC, because it follows the EDN standard of Ethereum, it has to update its blockchain constantly every time the EVM operating system that Ethereum uses and the other blockchains, uh, proof-of-stake blockchains used, um, every time they, they do the updates. And sometimes there is the risk that smart contract could break. And this breaks a, a principle which is that the blockchain has to work the same way in space and time. So if you have a, um, a smart contract that because of an upgrade stops working, that violates immutability in time because it, you used it for a while and then it broke. That doesn't have to happen. So uh, it happens with very few contracts. But to guarantee to all contracts uh, full immutability across time, uh, account versioning has to be um, implemented. It's called backward compatibility. Perma uh, permanently fix the gas limit to 8 million. Well, now today the gas limit in Ethereum Classic is 10 million. Um, but it should be limited to 8 million so that the blocks the block size cannot grow anymore this this reduces something that is called bloat which is that like in ethereum the blockchain can grow very big and it's difficult to enter the blockchain and and start uh, using a node in the blockchain so this may limit the amount of nodes globally um, Today, Ethereum Classic has 450 nodes approximately, and we want 45,000 nodes or 4.5 million nodes in the future. And for this, the blockchain should be small, so it's easier for any entity in the world or person to start running a node. Eventually, eliminating checkpointing and mess. Today, um, Ethereum Classic uh, has a technology called mess, not checkpointing. So, this is a mistake, it's just mess. Mess, which basically prevents. Uh, uh, double spends or attacks on Ethereum Classic, but this this technology um, can also uh, create a situation where the existing nodes um, <clears throat> may prevent other nodes from accessing the network. Uh, it's not happening, it's not likely, but it is a risk, so eventually it should have this in the roadmap of eliminating that feature, especially when Ethereum Classic grows and it doesn't need to defend itself anymore from attackers because it's, it's going to be so big. Um, I mean, the, the computing base, the mining base is going to be so big that it's very difficult. It, it's going to be very difficult to attack. So the, in terms of research projects for the future, <clears throat> uh, there has to be more, more, more ways of controlling bloat and the size of blocks. Uh, so there has to be more research from computer scientists and PhDs of how to control bloat in the future, how to compensate node operators so that more people want to come to the network and run nodes so we can grow to thousands or millions of nodes in the future. Um, and then moderate, moderately, moderately increase transactions per second. So I propose that even though we have to limit the, 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 the block size, maybe create or research new technologies where we can fit more transactions per block. So instead of having a current limit per day of a million and a half, we can raise it, say, to five million or something like that, which may would make um, ETC um, uh, a bit easier to use, especially when the transaction volume starts to to increase. Today, ETC is processing between seventy thousand and a hundred thousand transactions per day, but when it when it surpasses a million and a half, it's going to have a bloat problem and the fees are going to go up, even though it's good, but we, we could modulate that to more or less 5 million. I think uh, 5 million would be perfect to compete with um, high value systems in the world. And then full interoperability. Any technology like Fly Client, any new technology that may be created in the future or research or PhDs or computer scientists invent, it, ha it, it, it would be great to research and integrate into ETC. Thank you very much for watching this long video and this is the history and future of Ethereum Classic. Bye bye.